Hello, I'm going to continue looking at individualistic theories of criminality and psychodynamic theories. Today we're going to look at the psychodynamic theory of John Bowlby and then we're going to evaluate its effectiveness. Now the reality is that um, the psychodynamic theory that is put forward on the syllabus is that of Freud. Most of the textbooks will have Freud in it, a few do have this theory in it, um, but you're unlikely to get a direct question on it. However, I think as a psychodynamic theory, this is a lot more simple than Freud. So if you get asked to explain a psychodynamic theory of criminality, I think this one is the one to go with personally. It's up to you. You can choose uh, not to study this bit at all, or you can carry on and see what you think. I'll leave it open to you. So without further ado, let's continue. So just to recap, individualistic theories of crime hold that crime is caused by individual differences based on personality type or the experiences that people have. So they're arguing that the root of crime is in your individual psychological makeup and how you've developed and the things that you've experienced generally in early life, but not always. And as I said, in particular, in this uh, presentation, we're going to look at a psychodynamic theory that's linked to John Bowlby. And psychodynamic theories are keyed around personality. And that's the idea that our personality contains those forces that cause us to act the way that we do. And these forces, these urges, these feelings and conflicts come within our unconscious mind to a certain extent. So Freud, as we saw in my previous experience, um, would argue with that. And Bowlby, to a certain extent, would also say that's the case. So a criminal's behaviour is a result of their failure to resolve those conflicts in a socially acceptable way, or that deprivation, those um, urges, those feelings in a socially acceptable way. So John Bowlby, he was influenced by Freud's psychodynamic theory and his explanation for criminality was inspired by that psychodynamic approach. Here he is, young Bowlby, um, look, uh, analyzing a child. And his key idea was this. He said, our ability to form meaningful social relationships in adulthood is totally dependent on the close, warm and continuous relationship we have with the mother in the first few years. So if you don't have a close relationship with your mothers in your very early childhood, you are going to be unlikely to form meaningful social relationships in adulthood. That in turn will lead to criminality. Because the relationship acts with the mother in, in early childhood, acts as the basis for all future relationships. Its disruption will impair your ability to relate to others. And Bowlby thought that if the attachment's broken or disrupted, and for him during the first two and a half years of life, which he thought was the critical period, he thought within the two, if it's disrupted within the first two and a half years, the child will suffer irreversible long-term consequences of this maternal deprivation. And the risk continues for Bowlby until the age of five. And this results in a condition that Bowlby called affectionless psychopathy. And I've just clicked up this little picture of um, Romanian orphans, who would be a prime example of what Bowlby would say is lacking a continuous relationship with a mother in the early in the early years and therefore prone to this affectionless psychopathy. So affectionless psychopathy is the inability to experience guilt or strong emotions for others. And that prevents the person developing normal relationships and therefore is associated, as I said before, with criminality. Affectionless psychopaths can't appreciate the feelings of victims and so therefore they lack remorse. And Bowlby presented the evidence for his theory that early deprivation was related to criminal behaviour through his 44 Thieves study. Now, my recommendation would be every time you answer um, any question on Bowlby, make sure you get 44 Thieves in there somewhere. 
because the study is really straightforward and I'm going to go through that study with you now. So the 44 Thieves study was how Bowlby came up with this concept of affectionless psychopathy. His whole theory hinges on it. And his aim of the study was basically to show that the long term effects of maternal deprivation lead to um, criminality. It affects the uh, child in late um, checks that affects the adult in later life. So if you don't have if you have maternal deprivation, it's going to be you're breaking that maternal bond in the early stages of life and it's going to have serious effects on the intellectual, social and emotional development of the child. So how did you go about, <coughs> excuse me, trying to prove this or show this? Well, between 1936 and 1939, he took a sample of 88 children and they were selected from the clinic where Bowlby worked. Of the 88, 44 were juvenile thieves and had been referred to Bowlby because of their stealing. And then Bowlby selected a control group of another 44 children to act as controls. And they had emotional problems, but they hadn't yet committed any crime. So you've got one group of 44 children who are thieves and you've got another group of 44 children who aren't. And that's your control group. OK, so let's have a look at this 44 thieves study. So on arrival at the clinic, each child would have their IQ tested by a psychologist and at the same time a social worker would interview the parent to record details of the early child's, li of the child's early life. So in other words, to find out whether there had any, been any periods of separation within early childhood. And then the psychologist and the social worker made separate reports. The psychiatrist, Bowlby, would then conduct an initial interview with the child and accompanying parent and then would diagnose whether the child had affectionless psychopathy. And his findings were that more than half of the juvenile thieves had been separated from their mothers for longer than six months during their first years. And in the control group, only two had had such separation. So there was a big disparity. So the thieves appeared to have a lot of maternal deprivation whereas the control group had virtually none. And there were other findings as well, which are shown on this bar chart, which I'll look at in a minute. But you can see in terms of percentage of the thieves, well, um, if you've got of those with affectionless psychopathy, there was a, a proportion of the thieves over 20, nearly 30 or 30 odd percent there with affectionless psychopathy, none within the control group at all. Um, early separation, you can see the big difference between the thieves and the control group. So he found that 14 of the young thieves, 32%, as you saw in the bar chart early, showed affection of psychopathy. So they weren't able to care about or feel affection for others, whereas none of the control group were affection of psychopaths. He found that 86% of the affection of psychopaths in group one, the thieves, had experienced long periods of maternal separation for the age of five years. That was shown in the previous bar chart because they spent most of their years, early years in residential homes or hospitals where they hadn't been visited by their families. So Bob's conclusion was that maternal separation deprivation in the child's early life caused permanent emotional damage. And this condition he called affectionless psychopathy. So that's the theory and that's the study that backs up the theory. So let's evaluate it, starting with the strengths. Well, two strengths really, I think, for Bowlby. His research showed that more of his sample of 44 juvenile delinquents had suffered maternal deprivation than a control group of non-delinquents. So the figures stack up in his favour. And this supports Bowlby's theory increases our confidence in it as an explanation of criminal behaviour. The numbers stack up, it makes sense. And secondly, his work does show the need to consider the role of parent-child relationships in explaining criminality, something that's not considered with biological theories. Biological theories just go, it's in the genes. This is a different view on this. When it comes to limitations though, there are quite a few. 
OK, now let's look at the limitations of Bowlby. And we could start by firstly saying it was a retrospective study. So the delinquents and the mother had to recall accurately past events. Now, this is clearly a problem, especially if it involves any emotional, emotive experiences. So therefore, it would be true to say you can't be sure of the accuracy that those delinquents and mother gave. Therefore, the findings of Bowlby's um, study may have been skewed. Um, the other thing you could point out is that not all of the thieves had experienced early separation from their mothers. And so as a result of, the, of this, you can't conclude that maternal deprivation is the only cause of criminal of criminality. It therefore is only a partial explanation. And Bowlby's own later study of 60 children who've been separated from their parents for long periods of time before they find actually found no evidence of affectionless psychopathy. So that then raises an issue as to the validity of that earlier 44 Thieves study. So on to our final slide. Um, you could also add that Sammons and Putway note that the idea of a link between maternal deprivation and criminality is actually no longer widely accepted. And then it could be that maternal deprivation is one of a number of factors that could influence later criminal behaviour. A better explanation actually might be is to look at how biological factors maternal deprivation and other psychological and social factors interact to produce criminal behaviour. One explanation in isolation is not enough to explain all criminal behaviour. It's only a partial explanation. Hopefully you found that informative and I will see you at my next presentation.